Maybe you can start now. Yeah. I should. Intelligence is what you use when you don't know what to do. Predicting the future isn't magic, it's artificial intelligence. Some people call this artificial intelligence, but the reality is this technology will enhance us. So instead of artificial intelligence, I think we will augment our intelligence. A very good evening to all. I feel privileged to in extend my warm welcome to one and all present here for the day three international online faculty development program on perspective of artificial intelligence application. On behalf of the Department of Electronic and Communication Engineering in St. Joseph Institute of Technology, I am Baby Niveta D here to host today's session. Our limitation, it's only our imagination. On this pleasant evening, it gives us immense pleasure to cordially welcome our guest, Dr. Francis Buchiro, as our honorable speaker. We would like to extend our gratitude for accepting our invitation and joining us to share your knowledge. Welcome, sir. Our, respect and, our respect and gratitude to our chairman, Dr. B. Babu Manoharan, sir, our managing director, Mrs. B. Jessie Priya, ma'am, and director, Mrs. B. Sasi Segar, sir, our respected principal, Dr. P. Ravichandran, sir, who has always been a great source of inspiration for all of us. It's a pleasure to welcome the HODs of ECE department, Dr. C. Nyana Kausalya, ma'am, and Dr. G. Rohini, ma'am, and all our ECE staff members. Last but not least, I welcome all our participants. Welcome you all. Here are a few words about our speaker. Dr. Franz Buchiro has pursued his PhD and master degree in signal processing and communication from Northeastern University, Natick, Massachusetts, US. He's currently working as an engineering development manager at MathWork. He also accomplished many publications in a reputed journals such as IEEE Elsevier. He is expert in signal processing and digital communication algorithms, machine learning, deep learning, functional and architectural design, implementation and testing in software development cycle. He has research and teaching experience in areas of communication and signal processing. And his areas of interest are MATLAB for neuroscience and digital signal processing. Before getting into the session, I have few instructions to the participants. Participants, kindly mute your mic and video, kindly post your queries in the chat box which would be answered at the end of the session. Also, the feedback link will be provided at the end of the session. I consider it a great honor to have Dr. Franz Buchiro sir with us today. We are glad and eager to begin the session and I request you to start the session, sir. All right, thank you. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Franz Buchiro, as was already mentioned. I work at MathWorks. I'm a signal processing manager. I have been at MathWorks for 13 years now. And most of the time, my responsibility has been to develop features for the signal processing toolbox and for the wavelet toolboxes. So I'm very happy to be here to talk about uh, artificial intelligence for signal processing applications. And of course, uh, I'm going to relate most of the talk to tools that we have at MathWorks to solve these problems. So let's get started. So usually when you hear about deep learning, you think about, um, or, or artificial intelligence, you think about um, things applied to images. Deep learning was born and developed to, at an, impressi an impressive pace, specifically for image and computer vision problems. But now it is being increasingly applied to signal related applications across different industries. The data in these applications are signals coming from different types of sensors like microphones, radars, other receivers, and so on. Across the board, the predictive models in use are increasingly shifting to adopt deep learning. <clears throat> in this talk, you will learn how MATLAB empowers you to apply deep learning to signals. 
And to start, I want to talk about the typical workflows followed by engineers and scientists dealing with AI applications for signal processing. So deep learning falls under the realm of artificial intelligence and is a type of machine learning in which a model learns from vast amounts of data. Deep learning is usually implemented using a neural network architecture. A neural network consists of an input layer, many hidden layers that extract features, and an output layer that performs classification or regression. Usually, the content of the hidden layers uh, is trained so that it learns um, how to define different features using sample data. There is no correct approach to an AI problem for signal processing. The right approach depends on the size and the quality of your data set, the computational resources available, and the domain knowledge about the nature of the data and about the signal processing. So when you have a very large data set, feeding the network with raw data may be the best approach. However, on the other hand, a small data set combined with a machine learning approach with just the right features can achieve great performance. The price here is that good feature extraction requires domain knowledge. You need to understand your signals and you need to know signal processing in order to craft the best possible features. In between, we have other possibilities like combining deep learning approaches with pre-processing and feature extraction steps that you apply on signals. Part of, a big part of my talk will concentrate on these intermediate uh, uh, possibilities where you can combine feature extraction and neural networks to solve problems. So one of the most common deep learning architectures is the convolutional neural network or CNN. It consists of a deep stack of hidden layers that automatically extract features and learn underlying patterns from the data set. Another type of network that, you, that is used in signal processing is LSTMs. These networks are recurrent networks and recurrent networks help you preserve information that is learned from data through time. While the raw signals can be fed directly into the networks, in many cases, you will find some form of data pre-processing in front of them. For example, time frequency transformations are often used to convert signals into image-like representations to use network architectures like convolutional neural networks. On the other hand, with LSTM networks, it is common to extract time-varying features from the raw signals in order to lower the data rate and the complexity of the network. So we are usually told that we can train a deep network with just the raw data and that the network will figure out the features. This approach is unlikely to work when you're dealing with signals because most signals of interest have high dimensionality and variability. To successfully train a model, you're gonna have to need uh, to pre-process and extract features. This way you effectively will reduce the signal data dimensionality and variability. What you are doing is you're letting the network learn only the features that matter. So let's look at the deep learning for signal workflows in a little bit more detail. Most discussions about deep learning focus on developing predictive models. That is on the training of a model and, the and on designing the architectures. However, for an end-to-end -end workflow, steps like data augmentation, labeling, pre-processing, and deployment of the applications to embedded hardware or to the cloud are equally important. So keeping this workflow as a reference, let's go through some non-exhaustive list of challenges for signal applications. The key idea is to understand that you won't get a good model without good data. And that's even more true for signal and time series data for which a lot of work may be needed in these initial steps of the workflow. To train a deep uh, neural network, a large high quality data set is often required if you are dealing with, so, especially if you are dealing with supervised learning approaches in which on top of all, you will require to label data sets. Domain specific expertise and tools play a key role when preparing and pre-processing signal data to train networks. 
especially since you won't find quite as much published research in these application areas as you can find in computer vision areas. Once you have trained your models and, are, and they are ready to go, you will want to deploy them. It is often a challenge to write C or CUDA code for targeting embedded platforms. We will see how you can address these challenges with MATLAB as you go ahead. So let's start by looking at some of the things that you can do to generate, manage, and label signal data. Challenges in this step of the workflow consist of not having enough data, having to label a large amount of signals, which is a very tedious activity, and needing to access and manage large data sets, usually coming from files, having to create transform pipelines to extract features that can be fed into a network for training is also very painful. So let's look at the things that can be done to overcome the challenges. When you do not have enough data or no data at all, you can rely on synthetic data generation usually obtained by simulation. If you're working with communication problems, for example, you can generate standards or custom waveforms using apps like our wireless generator uh, app or 5G LTE wireless LAN and communication toolboxes. You can also add RF channel effects to create synthetic communication signals or augment measure signals by adding RF impairments. Other toolboxes contain physical models like the pedestrian and cyclist scattering models in the phase array system toolbox. This can help you train networks to identify objects based on microdoppler returns. We will talk more about this application in a, late, in a later example. So continuing with lack of data, if you're working with speech or audio problems, you can generate data by synthesizing speech signals from text. The text-to-speech function uses cloud-based speech synthesis uh, to connect to Google Speech, IBM Watson, or Microsoft Azure to synthesize text, uh, text into speech. You can also augment audio sets by changing the pitch or stretching the signals in time, adding noise or reverberation using the audio data augmented object. So data augmentation is a technique where you create variants of a signal either to make the, the signal data set larger because you don't have enough data or to make, give it impairments so that you can train a more robust model. So the, less, the next challenge in, in, in this first step is to label signal data for classification problems. Labeling da large data sets is time consuming and tedious. The signal labeler app that I'm showing here can make it easier. The app is an interference an interface that allows you to create label signal sets that are consistent no matter how many participate in the labeling process. Imagine that you are in a lab and multiple people in the lab decide to uh, label a large signal set. So you all divide the work between all the members. When it is time to put the data together, you realize that everybody used inconsistent label names and categories. So putting the data set together, it's a pain. So in the signal labeler, you can achieve consistency by uh, defining label definitions. So the labeler app allows you to manually label um, signal attributes like the name, sex, or age of a patient, or regions of interest, like for example, when the patient was walking or climbing stairs. So one of the most important features of the app is that it allows you to upload your custom automated labeling algorithms and run them over your entire data set. Here is an example where we train a deep network, in this case, an LSTM network, to detect regions of interest of electrocardiogram signals. Specifically, the network is able to identify the QRS regions, which are those prominent pulses circled on the left plot. So we uploaded a script to the app that calls the trained model of the classifier to automate the labeling of QRS regions. It is as simple as writing a function 
of loading into the app and click the run button. The app automatically runs the algorithms on all the signals in the data set and labels the regions of interest. So you may ask yourself, why do I need a labeler app if I already have a network that knows how to classify the regions of interest? And the answer is that you can significantly reduce the human effort of labeling by following an iterative labeling process. So you start by training a course model with just a few manually labeled signals. Using the app, you label the entire data set with the course model. You inspect a few new signals and correct incorrect labels manually. Correcting labels is a faster process than adding labels from scratch. And the course models get it right a good percentage of the time, especially as you advance in the iterations. So the last step is to just retrain a better model with your extended training set and iterate. Here is another example where we uploaded an audio function that connects to the IBM Watson speech to text service to label regions with the actual spoken word. Once you have labeled segments, you can train a model to, for example, the text speech under noisy scenarios by adding noise and other impairments to the labeled data set. The MATLAB audio toolbox offers other automated labeling functions like the text speech or sound class recognition based on YAMnet that allows you to identify several different audio classes from water sound to explosions. So once you have labeled the data, you have to consume the data, process it, and feed it into a network for training. You can do this using data stores. You start with the labeler app, you export your label set into data stores, you use data stores to consume the labeled data and to define a pre-processing and feature extraction pipeline that modifies signals and labels congruently. Then you pass the data store into the training function of the model to train it. So now let's talk about some of the most relevant tools for pre-processing and feature extraction. Specifically, let's talk about these functions related to signals. The biggest challenges when, you, when working on pre-processing and extracting features are, you need domain knowledge to implement the feature extraction algorithms. And sometimes you don't really know what features to extract. Recall that feature extraction is very important to reduce variability and improve performance of your networks. So the first thing you usually do is you need to figure out what type of pre-processing and feature extraction you need to apply to the data. A common first step is to visualize and explore the data in multiple domains to understand the main nuances and the features of the signals. The Signal Analyzer app allows you to do this uh, by exploring signals simultaneously in the time, in the frequency, and in the time frequency domains. It also lets you transform the data and explore the pre-processing steps. When satisfied with the results, the app generates automatically MATLAB code that you can use to process your entire signal set. The generated scripts target a variety of functions in our toolbox catalogs. Let's take a look at some of the most important feature extraction algorithms available in MATLAB. And let's start with time frequency transformations. If you start with a long signal segment like this one, where time flows along the x-axis, think about taking subsequent signal frames or buffers and stacking them along each other. If you, can do in, if you keep doing this until you cover a sufficient time span, you will, be the, you will have a matrix of windowed segments. Then all you have to do is to transform each of these columns into the frequency domain using an FFT or similar types of transformations. What you end up is with a 2D representation that tells you how the frequency spectrum of your signal changes over time. There exist several variations of this theme depending on the type of signal and the requirements of the application. What we saw here is just simply called a spectrogram. But there are other types of transformations. For example, 
Speech applications use variations of the spectrogram with frequencies spaced logarithmically, like in the human ear, as opposed to linearly. Similar considerations apply to the constant Q transform, which conserve the, conserves the so-called quality factor along the y-axis. Or the wavelet-based approaches, which tend to return a sharper time resolution, especially on transients. Choosing the right approach also depends on trade-offs between things like expertise, algorithm availability, computational cost, and accuracy. In the case of time frequency um, representations, what they do is they provide all the information on your original signal, but using a different view of it. Usually, distinct features of a signal become way more evident in the time frequency domain. And that is why using them to train networks is so effective. For networks of lower complexity, for example, LSTMs, time frequency representation may not be the right approach. You want to feed those networks with time series, but at lower sample rates and with lower variance than those of the raw signals that come from the sensors. In these cases, it's common to use just a few scalar metrics referred to as features. For example, individual metrics of the spectrum like bandwidth or center frequency, or peak positions or transition points when looking at the original signals over time. Generic approaches like this may find use across different applications. However, applications where uh, the use of machine learning is already pretty established will tend to use more specific features. I've grouped here a selection of popular feature extraction algorithms available in MATLAB. For example, you might know things like MFCC and pitch, if you've worked with speech, or microdoppler analysis, which we, show, we, we saw earlier, if you're familiar with radar. There are several other feature extraction and transformation techniques for radar, audio, sensor fusion, text analytics, navigation, and so on. So what happens when you really don't know what features to extract? Using automatic feature extraction algorithms is a great option. What I'm showing here is a wavelet scattering network. These networks are deep networks, but that do not learn weights. They are set, the, the weights are directly set to wavelets. So you don't train these networks. These networks already come with weights that are set to wavelets. This is a feature extraction, uh, extraction technique that returns very low variant features that can be fed to a model. Scattering networks move signals of the same class together and signals of different classes farther apart. We have tested this feature extractor with many examples with impressive state-of-the-art result and fairly low complexity. To give a simple idea of how scattering networks build signal representation useful for learning, Consider this set, set of six short duration simulated signals. In the figure, we have the scalogram of six short duration signals. The first three are different modulations on a pulse train. The second three are the same modulation applied to noise. If we were to, if we were to just use a scalogram as a feature extractor, the neural network would have a very hard time classifying the signals because their time frequency map is not very distinct from each other. However, if we take a look at the scattering transform output, we can see that the scattering network really moves the different types of signals apart, making it much easier for the network to distinguish them and classify them. Think about this. You, with your eyes, have a better time classifying the signals on the second image than on the first one, and so does the network. <clears throat> So continue with this idea of having, uh, of don't having, don't don't knowing uh, when you don't know what features to extract. Um, having predefined networks capable of doing automated feature extraction is a, is great. The audio toolbox has a function VGGish that wraps a popular network that has trained on very large YouTube audio set datasets. The network extracts 128 state of the art features that then you can use to feed into a model for training. <clears throat> Again, 
what this network does, it packs features of the signals that are closer together, closer, and signals that are different, uh, packs them much farther apart. <clears throat> so we have gone through two, <clears throat> excuse me. We have gone through two workflow steps that allow us to prepare a high quality signal data set to be used to train a network. The next step is to choose a network architecture <clears throat> and to train it and test it. The challenges in this step involve choosing the network architecture and optimizing its parameters, training the network, and accelerating the process using GPUs. There are usually three main steps to develop a deep learning model. Design your network, train the design network, and optimize the network. You can either design your network from scratch programmatically or using the Deep Network Designer app. Or you can import some reference models like AlexNet, GoogleNet, BGG16, etc., and use the already trained architectures for your specific deep learning tasks. The next step is to train your designed or import modified network and to scale the computation to the available resources. You can scale the computation to the available resources, for example, using physical GPUs available in your machine or GPUs available in your company in the premise of your organization. Or you can also scale up your computations to the GPUs on the cloud platforms. Once you train your network, there might be some tuning needed to optimize the network performance in terms of accuracy. You know, this is called hyperparameter optimization, and it can be a very tedious process if you do it manually, especially because training takes some long times in, in, in many applications. So MATLAB offers a, a simple way to uh, optimize hyperparameters by using Bayesian optimization. Training can be length, a lengthy process, and this is why um, being able to do this on a GPU is of great advantage. Now, in, this is not a linear process. You're going to have to go back and forth between the three steps in order to get the best model. And as I mentioned, when you look at your train model, you're going to look, you're going to see its performance, and then you're going to design if you need to redefine the architecture or if you need to redefine the hyperparameterization. Again, since this is an iterative process, you want training to be fast, and you can achieve this using GPUs. So training networks for signal processing applications require pre-processing and feature extraction steps, as I have mentioned before. So if you want to accelerate training using GPUs, then you also have to make sure that the signal processing functions that you use for pre-processing and feature extraction also run well on the GPUs. So more and more of our feature extraction functions support GPU acceleration now, including wavelet scattering, continuous wavelet transforms, short time free air transforms, and spectral estimators. Now, imagine that your colleagues work in a different deep learning framework like PyTorch or TensorFlow. You can use the standards and importers we provide to bring these models into MATLAB. <clears throat> Once you've imported the reference models or models created by your colleagues in MATLAB, you can visualize and debug the network architecture using the Deep Network Designer app. You can augment or optimize the hyperparameters, and you can make use of our automated code generation to target multiple platforms. When you have a model in Python, <clears throat> sorry, you can still use our signal processing tools to perform pre-processing and feature extraction. You don't have to leave MATLAB to perform all your signal processing tasks. It is a simple task as um, defining a MATLAB engine in Python and then calling MATLAB functions that include all your signal processing steps. Generative adversarial networks, or GANs, have been all over the technical press in the last couple of years due to their exceptional ability 
to synthesize realistic but random samples of data that have never existed before. Defining and training again requires more advanced knowledge than your average network. We have examples where we show in detail how to build such a model in MATLAB. We use the most recent versions of the deep learning APIs from the deep learning toolbox that allows us to perform automated differentiation and build really any type of architecture. I invite you to visit our examples after the talk. All right, so when it's time to deploy your application, you will need to generate code, C and CUDA code, depending on your target, both for the model and for the pre-processing feature extraction steps. This is important to notice. Not only you need code generation for the model, but also for the pre-processing steps that you, that you apply in front of the model. So the challenges here are, first of all, that you need to generate the C and GPU code for the feature extraction steps. And finally, you need to validate the models using real data. <clears throat> so MATLAB has a great variety of C and GPU code generator support now for spectral analysis, time frequency analysis, and key wavelet functions so that you can deploy your networks with any type of feature extract on pre-processing to any target. Another final step on the workflow is to validate models possibly trained with synthetic data. You do this by collecting real data and verifying the network accuracy. If you're working with comms problems, for example, we have tools to give you SDR connectivity to collect data. If you're working with audio, we have tools that support streaming data from the most popular sound cards. And we have various other packages to connect to different hardware and cards, like for example, the Vitalino card shown here, a popular low cost card that allows you to collect ECG, EEG, and MEG signals. <clears throat> so now that we, we have gone through the entire workflow, let's work through some examples to show our tools and the workflow in action. So in the first example, I wanna show you how to segment ECG signals into its P, QRS, and T regions. <clears throat> so here we have signals that have been seg segmented or labeled by a cardiologist into the different waveforms. Blue waveforms are P waves, Orange waveforms are QRS waves, and yellow waveform, waveforms are T waves. The black pieces are just uh, uh, regions that have no interest. So in this particular example, the data set contains 210 ECG signals with about 15 minutes long uh, duration. And they were labeled by cardiologists. So we use a signal data store that allows us to manage the signal data that is very large and does not fit in memory. We can bring in sampling rate and time value information into the signal data store. We then split the data for testing and training and perform basic pre-processing to resize and normalize the data. Once we have our signals ready, we can try to directly use an LSTM network to, to, to see the results. The LSTM network that I'm showing here is fairly simple. It only has five layers. Our output of the LSTM is the desired segments. So you can think of this as a sequence to sequence classification where every sample of the input signal is classified into a sample at the output. So sample one may be classified as QRS or P or T or don't care and sample two the same, and sample three the same, and so on. When you feed the raw data into the LSTM network, the accuracy that we obtain is quite low, 72%. But we can apply some domain knowledge of the ECG signals. If you're a cardiologist, or if you deal with bioengineering, you know that um, uh, ECG signals suffer from some, something called baseline wandering. Baseline wandering is just a DC offset that you see in ECG signals, usually caused by respiratory movement. So a simple high-pass filter 
can remove this offset and reduce signal variability. So if we apply a high pass filter before the network, the results now go from 72% to 91%. Impressive. <clears throat> the network did not have to learn irrelevant information, which is this DC offset, and instead concentrated on the features that matter. So notice a very simple uh, knowledge of ECG of the ECG signal nature and high pass filter gets you from 72% to 91% accuracy without having to change the size of the data set or the architecture of the network. So you can go a little bit more sophisticated and use a, transform a better transformation to extract better features. I already told you that time frequency transforms are great because they really differentiate the signal features. The Fourier synchro squeeze transform computes a frequency spectrum for each signal sample so that it is ideal for the segmentation problem because we maintain the same time resolution as the original signals. The Fourier synchro squeeze transform of each signal in the training set is computed only over the bandwidth of interest to still remove the baseline wandering. The transform data is applied to the LSTM to now get an accuracy of 94%. So three percent percentage uh, points above the high pass filter. Again, in this type of application, 3% improvement in accuracy, it's a great uh, improvement. So here are the end results. You can see on the top plot the ground truth, that is the, the signal as it was labeled by the cardiologist. And on the bottom plot, you can see the signal as it was labeled by the network. Pretty close indeed. The last step in this workflow was to deploy this example to hardware. We use the Raspberry Pi support package for MATLAB and the MATLAB coder to generate C code and deploy the example to the Raspberry Pi board. The Raspberry Pi board uses a, the ARM processor and the generated code uses ARM compute library to generate highly optimized code. You can use the coder products to deploy the application logic and models with optimized code to the Intel and ARM processors. Most of the functions, as I already mentioned in signal processing toolbox and wavelet toolbox support C code generation now. Key functions are also supported for GPU code generation, so you can generate CUDA code for execution on an NVIDIA GPU board. All right, so let's look at another example. In this case, what we will try to do is identify the music genre from a segment of audio. We use the GTSAN dataset, which is a public available dataset that has 100 songs in each of 10 different genres. So there are genres like you know, heavy metal, pop, classical, electronic, Latin, et cetera. This example focuses on the automatic, automatic feature extraction and building of a predictive model. So what do we do to classify this if I don't know what features to extract? The answer is we can use wavelet scattering. Why do we use wavelet scattering? I talked about it in the beginning of the talk and think of it as a convolutional neural network where the weights of the layers are being learned and updated with every iteration, right? Usually that's the way it works. Networks learn weights, but not in wavelet scattering. In wavelet scattering, the weights are fixed and set to wavelets. Now, wavelet scattering networks um, are feature extractors that return very low variant features that we can then feed to a classifier. This technique is a very good option when you are not sure which feature would be the right ones to extract, or when you do not have uh, in access to a large amount of data required to train a model with high accuracy. Finally, it can help you re relieve requirements on learning complexity and data set size. So coming back to our example, once we have the audio data set downloaded and ready to use, we can use wavelet scattering 
which is implemented in MATLAB with a very simple function with one parameter, right? So in two lines of code, you can perform weighted scattering on the entire data set and feed it to a network. In this case, the output of the wavelet scattering network is fed to a simple SVM classifier, support vector machine. So this is not even using deep learning as a classifier, it's using machine learning as a classifier. All right, so applying the output of the um, wavelet scattering network to an SVM classifier gives us 88% accuracy, which if you look at, uh, papers and uh, publications out there, this is state-of-the-art performance. Now, bear in mind that we can potentially get equally good results with the custom feature extraction uh, methodology by applying perfect features extracted with domain expertise. The cool thing here is that you don't have to be an expert to get the best uh, you know, state-of-the-art accuracy. So bottom line is, if you do not have the domain expertise, this technique can be particularly useful for you. Now, you could also replace the classifier from a machine, machine learning SVM classifier to an LSTM network if you wanted to, or even to a CNN network. And we have examples in our documentation that show this. So finally, we created an app to take in the streaming signal and perform classification. Here, we are listening to a piece of classical music from Mozart, and the app records it and runs the classification and is able to correctly identify the genre as classical. Sorry, all right. So that's, uh, that concludes the, the second example. And I have one more example to show. In this third and last, last example, we solve an autonomous driving problem that requires recognizing pedestrians and cyclists. Carbound radars come to the rescue here. Radar micro Doppler acquisitions are classified into combinations of cyclist and pedestrian targets that in principle support video based in principle to support video based detections so we use models of a pedestrian and of a bicycle to compute micro doppler or radar returns uh, and synthesize a, an entire data set so the pro imagine if you had to do this with real data getting labeled radar data for these types of scenarios can be incredibly complex the answer here is to use simulated data and provide free labeling and virtually unlimited number of scenarios to generate. The example in this case also illustrates how to transform the data so that it can be fed into a convolutional neural network by transforming it into time frequency maps shown there using short time Fourier transform. In this example, using short time Fourier transform and a convolutional neural network, we were able to obtain a 95% accuracy to detect either one pedestrian present in the scenario or one cyclist or two pedestrian or two cyclists or one pedestrian and one cyclist. Now, this model was completely trained with synthetic data. So the next step was to actually measure some data with a real radar and applying it to our trained network. The results were impressive. We got 83% accuracy, even you know, with, with the network that was just trained with synthetic data. So that is great. We didn't have to collect data and label it, and we still got great accuracy when we tried this with real data. OK, so let's tie up the loose ends now. We discussed the challenges in deep learning workflows pertaining to signal processing applications. Based on this talk, we'll revisit some of the points that we covered in the presentation that address the pain points. It is important to iterate uh, the point that the models are only as good as the data. 
We saw how you can synthesize your data for applications where you may not be able to collect real data. You can also look at data augmentation techniques that can be used for applications like audio, where you may have labeled data, but the data set is small. For labeling, we talked about the label, uh, Signal Labeler app. As for the domain-specific expertise, we saw how some of the feature extractor and transformations can aid across different domains, such as audio and speech, text, sensor fusion, and radar. You can access models built in major frameworks such as TensorFlow or Python to leverage latest research. And lastly, we saw how MATLAB can help in taking your networks with application logic and generating code to target multiple platforms for deployment. These are the MATLAB strengths that you can leverage to address the challenges you saw. So we have many resources to get you started, especially we have a lot of examples in our different toolboxes. Most of them are under a machine and deep learning section. So go and visit them and get started. A lot of our customers have actually uh, looked at these examples and got their applications running by following uh, you know, the, what we were doing in the examples. So thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir, for sharing your knowledge and experience. Now on to the question and answer session. First question, what is GAN and machine learning? So if I understand the question correctly, they're asking what is a GAN? So a GAN is a network. Yeah, yeah. yes. GAN is a type of architecture where you train a network to um, fake uh, original or real signals. So it's usually a dual network architecture. One network tries to identify fake signals while the other network tries to fake the signals. And as they fight against each other, that's why they are called adversarial networks. They end up creating very high fidelity uh, signals or images that never existed before. You might have seen examples of uh, uh, networks that create human faces that never existed before. The same can be done with signals. We have examples where we create, uh, for example, signals for uh, vibration signals on, on, the, um, on car tires or failure signals for pump um, machinery, et cetera. So again, they are used to synthesize data based on example data. Okay, so why do we need baseline wandering for ECG signal? Okay, so as I showed in the ECG example, when, when you do not correct baseline wandering, the ECG signal varies a lot. Let me try to find, uh, hopefully I can, I can find this um, slide quickly so that I can show you in the, in the plot what I mean by that. Um, let's see if I can find it quickly here. So here it is. Let me quickly show you this. Let me see if uh, maybe you might, you, do you see my screen now? No, no, sir. All right, so. No, sir. All right, so let me see if I can reshare the screen. It happened to me at the beginning of the talk as well, but um, hopefully I can show this, this again. Um, I think you can tell him how to. All right, so here I am. I'm not going to use the presentation mode because that's what's been causing uh, me to lose the, the sharing of the screen. But hopefully you can see the slide here. Um, please let me if you can. not um, See if I can make it as large as possible. All right, I don't know why it's not showing as large as I wanted it to be. But hopefully you can see it here. The bottom line is that when you have baseline wandering because of respiratory problems, your ECG signal is varying in its DC offset. You can see that red line that I painted across the DC offset of the signal. Now, if you remove that wandering, then there's no more DC offset. The signal is always centered around zero. So imagine if you're, if you're trying to learn features of this signal, one of the features that the network is learning is that the signal changes with 
you know, the signal offset changes with time. That's an irrelevant feature. If you remove that feature, then the network can concentrate on more important features. And that's why it makes a much better job once you remove it by removing the low pass noise. I hope that's clear now. Okay, so next one, what is VGG-ish model? Yeah, so VGG is, uh, it's a network uh, designed for audio. Let me find the, the um, particular, so here it is. And again, I'm not going to go into presentation mode because I lose the sharing. But BGG, um, it's, a, it's a network that was um, trained with a YouTube audio set. So it was trained with a lot of, of, of different audio uh, signals, right? So it, th this network now acts almost like a wavelet scattering network. You pass in audio and it outputs a matrix of 128 features, right? So think about a BGG's network as some, some, some processing that converts your audio signal into very low variant features that really capture the true essence of the audio signals. So you pretty much, what you have done is you have removed any feature that is not relevant and kept the most important ones. And now you can feed that into a model and just as when, as when we remove baseline wandering, here, this network learns how to remove all sorts of irrelevant features and just keep the key ones. And now you can use that to feed a model and have a great performance. So it's the same idea as, as you know, the, the uh, removing baseline wandering, but in this case, it's with a network that was shown hundreds and thousands of different audio signals and was trained with them. And now you can use it for your own problems. Mm. Okay, so the next one, why to use long short term memory in artificial neural network? Yeah, so whenever you're dealing, oh, finally I was able to make it larger. So, so whenever you're dealing with signal processing applications, you know, signal plus, signals are sequences and Recurrent neural networks are great for sequences. So a very natural choice is to use an LSTM network. Now, it's not the only choice, but it's a great choice. Now, when does an LSTM is really important is when you do have memory uh, consideration. So if your signal samples uh, at time T1 correlate with signal samples at time Tn in the future, then the network, it, it's great when a network can actually have information about the past. Recurrent neural networks can keep information about the past. Convolutional neural networks cannot. So again, if you have correlation between past samples and future samples, a good option is to use a recurrent neural network. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. The next one, any specific reason you focus on accuracy in your examples rather than precision and recall using confusion matrix? No particular reason. It's very common to actually use, uh, you know, uh, this, this type of matrices and look at just, you know, the errors between input labels and output labels. That's all I'm doing, right? Okay, yeah. if the input label is label A, then I need to make sure that the input output label is also A. If not, I consider that an error. Otherwise I consider it an, uh, you know, a, a, a correct answer. And that's how I'm computing the percentages here. And the last one, do you suggest any learning so sources for deep learning, machine learning, signal processing using MATLAB? Yes, definitely. Uh, as I showed in the last slide here, we have a very large amount of examples uh, in our documentation that talk about different applications for signal processing. Again, we have examples that deal with ECG signals. We have examples that deal with audio. We have examples that deal with radar. We have examples that deal with communication signals. We have examples that deal with vibration signals from the, uh, fr from the uh, uh, how do you say, the suspension system of a car, et cetera. So again, we, we even have an example that um, shows how to estimate uh, pavement cracks from the vibration of the suspension of a car. 
So if you go to the signal processing toolbox, wavelet toolbox, audio toolbox, and deep learning toolboxes, and look for examples, you'll find a wide variety. I have seen many students and actual companies uh, look at our examples, follow the examples, and solve their application, even if it's not the same type of application. Even if they're not doing ECG, they will figure out you know, how that ECG application maps to their own application. So I really invite you to start looking at examples. We also have various uh, white papers and you know, other videos and resources and blogs uh, put out by MathWorks in order to teach deep learning. So I invite you to look at those as well. But I think that um, uh, a great uh, source is to look at the examples. Again, <clears throat> a lot of us really do not have a lot of time to go very super deep into the math and the core of the architectural design of these things. So it is great to see how you know, we have tools that just can do the, do the things for us without us having to delve very deep into the, into the core of the uh, theory. So starting with examples, it's a great way to start solving your problems. And then maybe after that, you can start delving into deeper into the theory of why these things work. Thank you, sir. That was awesome session. And now it's time to express our gratitude. First of all, I extend my sincere thanks to the Almighty for making today's event a grand success. I extend a hearty thank to Dr. Franz Bochiro in helping us to understand about artificial intelligence in signal processing. Once again, thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. My heartfelt thanks to our beloved chairman, Dr. B. Babu Manoharan, sir, for his consistent upkeep in conducting this webinar. My sincere thanks to our managing director, Mrs. B. Jessie Priya, ma'am, and our director, sir, Mrs. B. Sasi Segar, our respected principal, Dr. B. Ravichandran, sir, for their guidance in conducting this webinar. I also thank our head of department, Dr. C. Nyana Kausalya, ma'am, staff and student affairs, and Dr. G. Rohini, ma'am, lab efforts, and all other faculties for organizing this event successfully. Last but not least, I thank all the active participants for your constant support. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.